good day. A meeting took place by video conference on Tuesday 30th March 2021 between Russian President Vladimir Putin, German Pop Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President Emmanuel Macron. Before discussing what took place during this meeting in detail, I should say that this format of Putin meeting with the German and French leaders together in uh, a uh, private conference is by no means unique. It began to develop over the course of the Ukrainian crisis when the Germans and the French essentially took over from the EU bureaucracy all discussions between the EU and Russia on Ukrainian issues but it has since broadened to cover other topics. The fact, by the way, that it is Merkel and Macron who address Putin in these meetings, and the fact that they also, when doing so, appear to speak for the entire EU, shows the true, the true power, where the true power within the EU lies. It does not lie with the likes of Claude Michel, President of the European Council, or Ursula von der Leyen, uh, President of the European Commission. It, require, it lies with the leaders of the two most powerful countries within the EU, Merkel and Macron. To those, by the way, I should add the third powerful national leader who participates in EU meetings, who is the President of the United States, with Joe Biden recently attending by, virtual con by, by video conference a meeting of the European Union's European Council. However, I will discuss that more fully another time. On this occasion, it was Merkel and Macron who spoke with Putin and did so clearly um, in, uh, as representatives of the EU. Um, I should say that it is not clear from the readout or transcript of the meeting that the Kremlin has provided who exactly it was who instigated the call, but I'm going to make a guess that it was Merkel, uh, Merkel herself. So what led to this call? Why has there been a decision for Merkel and Macron to speak to Putin at this particular time? Well, the short answer is that it is the events of the last few weeks. Firstly, there is the massive problem of the EU's crisis in medication rollouts, which I have discussed in multiple programmes. The EU having completely trashed the reputation of uh, the AstraZeneca product, which is now um, limited in Germany only to patients over the age of 60, faces a severe medication shortfall, even as the case count of the pandemic within the EU is rising. Let me quickly add my traditional comment here, I make no scientific or medical judgments on any matters relating to the pandemic or to the med medications that, um, e that are involved in treating or limiting it. I don't have those qualifications. This is a, this is a channel that looks at political news and which carries out political analysis only. However, the EU is in such a crisis, such a self-created crisis, and clearly this is a topic which Ma uh, Merkel and Macron want to discuss with Putin as they face a shortfall of medications and as the case count in Europe rises. I will come to that in more detail shortly. Then there is the issue of Ukraine which, again, I have also discussed in various programmes on this channel, where um, there has been, as many of you know, a build-up of Ukrainian forces on the ceasefire line, an exchange of shelling, and there's been talk, constant talk, 
of a Ukrainian military offensive which might be pending. That definitely is an issue that all three leaders would want to talk about and about which they would want to send a clear signal. I will discuss that aspect of the discussion shortly. In my opinion, though the pandemic and Ukraine are the important is are important issues which the leaders will have wanted to discuss, they are not the true reason for this call. The true reason for this call is the disastrous uh, uh, set of political developments that have taken place in East-West relations and in the ge global geostrategic atmosphere over the last few weeks. Firstly, there was the disastrous visit to Moscow of Europe's high representative on foreign affairs, Josep Borrell, who is, of course, a member of the EU bureaucracy. As you will recall from my previous discussions of Borrell's visit, he came to Moscow intending to lecture the Russians on their human rights record and specifically on the issue of the Russian action against the Russian dissident politician and blogger Alexei Navalny. He received from the Russians an uncompromising reception. He found himself steamrolled over by uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in one-to-one -one, uh, talks. And um, to uh, Borrell's obvious and visible discomfiture, he was thrown onto the defensive and embarrassed in a humiliating news conference which took place in Moscow. Um, Borrell afterwards left Moscow very much within his, with his tail between his legs and back in Brussels started agitating for more sanctions against Russia. That call from Borrell for sanctions has, however, met a stony reception from the Germans and the French. Part of the purpose of this call undoubtedly was on the part of Merkel and Macron to repair some of the damage Borrell's visit has done. There is, however, an even greater overarching uh, reason why this meeting took place. There has been, over the last few weeks, a steady deterioration in, inter in the international atmosphere, as it has become increasingly clear that we are in a situation of superpower rivalry between the United States and China. There was the humiliating sub summit, humiliating for the United States, that is, between uh, Secretary Blinken and a strong Chinese delegation at Anchorage in Alaska, which I have also discussed in a previous uh, programme. And there have been, since then, strong words exchanged between China and the United States on a variety of topics. The Chinese, meanwhile, have, as I have discussed in a recent video, also taken further steps. They have uh, now acted decisively to uh, support Iran, concluding a 25-year strategic partnership treaty with Iran, which will provide Iran with the economic support it needs to withstand US sanctions. And of course, there is the general sense, which is now growing around the world, that the competition between China and the US is evolving into a form of superpower competition, which tracks, even if it does not exactly reproduce, the superpower competition which existed between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The Europeans are highly conscious of the difficult position which that puts them in, both politically and economically. They have little reason to pick a fight with China. They are not directly involved in competition in the Pacific region, and they have strong economic links 
with China. At the same time, they are becoming increasingly nervous by the drift of Russia towards an ever tighter relationship uh, of Russia towards an ever tighter relationship with China. They will have noted um, Sergei Lavrov's visit to China and his meeting with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Guilin. And they will also have noted the strong words coming out of both Beijing and Moscow about the strength of their strategic partnership, their de facto alliance with each other. The Europeans are becoming increasingly nervous that in the words of Emmanuel Macron, who has talked about this topic extensively, Europe is losing Russia and Russia is now starting to form an ever closer relationship and alliance with China. So, from the European point of view, things are not looking good. On the one hand, the United States is refocusing its energies away from Europe towards rivalry with China in the Asia-Pacific region. Over time, that inevitably means that the weight of American power is going to be transferred away from Europe towards confronting China in the Asia-Pacific, leaving the Europeans more exposed in dealing with Russia. On the other hand, they sense that they have alienated Russia uh, pushed it towards an alliance with Russia and with the gradual departure of the United States will face a situation where they are facing a, a Russia which um, um, the EU uh, leaders realise is militarily far more powerful than they are and which moreover has China at its back. That is an alarming prospect, and obviously it causes them great concern. In addition, some European leaders, Macron especially, have probably been able to read the numbers and understand that the critical mass of Russia and China together, the combination of their militaries, their economic weight, their resources, and their technology not only equals that of the United States, but in some measures indeed surpasses it, with all the indications of the stronger growth being on the Chinese-Russian side as opposed to the American. So, from the European point of view, as often discussed by Macron, this de facto alliance between China and Russia is bad news. And anything they can do to try to draw the Russians away from the Chinese is worthwhile and is something that must be attempted. So, partly the purpose of Macron and Merkel in talking to Putin on, tu on Tuesday was to get him to try and maintain a dialogue with the EU on various topics so that he doesn't drift too close to China and so that the Russians remain convinced, which after Burrell's visit, they were openly doubting that there is some purpose in continuing the relationship with the EU. Having said this, it's absolutely clear from the uh, readout the Kremlin has provided of the talks that the uh, Europeans, that Merkel and Macron, found Putin in a completely uncompromising move. On every topical issue, he refused to give an inch. Now, I'm going to deal with them step by step, and I'm going to discuss briefly what was said. Firstly, let's talk about uh, the first paragraph of the readout, and it reads as follows. The talks focused on the task of consolidating efforts against a common threat, the pandemic. In this context, the leaders discussed 
measures to prevent the further spread of the infection, including the outlook for the registration of the Russian Sputnik V medication in the EU and possible deliveries and joint production of the medication in the EU countries. I think myself that this is something of a, um, of a mirage. I don't think the EU is really interested in importing or setting up co-production with Russia of Sputnik V. I may be wrong about this, but I read recently that the European Medicines Agency will only consider whether or not to license Sputnik V for use within the EU in May, and that any production agreements will only start to bear fruit in about a year. So there is no realistic prospect of Sputnik V filling the space or filling the gap created by the EU's rejection of the AstraZeneca uh, uh, medication. Besides, Russia itself um, has had production issues with Sputnik V. The Russian uh, pharmaceutical industry all but collapsed during the 1990s, and though there's been a steady uh, work rebuilding it, it is only in the last few weeks that Russia has started to produce volumes of medications, including Sputnik V, sufficient to, to uh, provide doses for its entire population. It will take a long time before the Russians have, an, uh, have increased production of Sputnik V and other such medications that they are producing in sufficient quantities to be able to export them to the EU. Realistically, I don't see that happening before autumn at the earliest. I frankly believe that all this talk about the EU importing Sputnik V, despite the enormous political obstacles involved in that, is essentially a bait used by the Europeans, or to be more precise, Merkel and Macron, in order to provide an excuse for a dialogue with the Russians. It enables them to meet with Putin and to talk about other topics, it, it, giving the appearance that what they're talking about is the pandemic and Sputnik V, in the knowledge that talking about the pandemic and Sputnik V is somehow less controversial. It also means, by the way, that by floating the idea of the EU importing Sputnik V and um, creating or agreeing with the Russians co-production in Europe of Sputnik V, the Europeans are able to persuade Putin to talk to them. He might be less willing to do so if the topics instead were confined to Ukraine and other issues like the China, like the China Russia relationship. So I think that though we learn from this uh, transcript that the talks focused on the task of consolidating efforts against a common threat, namely the pandemic, uh, in other words, the uh, greater part of the discussions may have been around this issue. That was probably, almost certainly, in fact, not the real topic that was most seriously discussed, and it was not the true reason for this call. In fact, we now come to the topics that were more um, acutely discussed, and we learn very quickly what they were. Firstly, there were Ukraine, Belarus, Libya, Iran and the JCPOA, Syria, um, the, um, um, and um, the general relationship between Russia and the EU. As part of the latter, the topic of Navalny was also discussed. Let's start with Ukraine 
about which the transcript says more than on any other topic in, that took place during the discussion. I'm going to read what the tra Kremlin's transcript says, and I'm going to read it in full, specifically on the topic of Ukraine. During an in-depth exchange of views on the situation in Ukraine, the leaders confirmed the lack of alternatives to the 2015 Minsk package of measures as the basis for a settlement of the internal conflict in that country. The President of Russia emphasised that it is important that the Kiev authorities implement all the previous agreements reached at the top level, primarily on establishing a direct dialogue with Donetsk and Lugansk and settling the legal aspects of a special status for Donbass. The Russian leader expressed serious concern about the escalation of armed confrontation on the contact line being provoked by Ukraine and its refusal to implement the additional measures to strengthen the ceasefire coordinated by the trilateral contact group in July 2020. The leader's political advisers will continue with their joint efforts. So here we have it. It's very clear what Putin said. Firstly, note that it was an in-depth discussion. When we hear about an in-depth discussion, that means a discussion that lasted a long time and in which Putin made his views entirely clear and clear in the strongest terms. In fact, we learn from the uh, uh, last paragraph in the uh, Kremlin readout that the talks were held in a businesslike and frank atmosphere. Frank is almost certainly the operative word here. Putin will express himself clearly and in strong language. Maybe there wasn't a row exactly, but uh, there is no doubt at all that Putin did not hold back in any significant way. And he did get the Europeans to accept that it is the 2015 Minsk package of measures, the agreements which were entered between Ukraine and the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's uh, Republics at a meeting brokered by Putin, Merkel and the then French president Hollande in Minsk, that it is though that uh, a package of measures which still constitutes the basis of the overall basis of a Ukrainian settlement. I say that because the Ukrainians have been repeatedly hinting that they want to move away from the Minsk agreement. They want instead to come up with an alternative uh, uh, roadmap to reintegrate these two regions, Donetsk and Lugansk, in Ukraine, and that they do not want to talk to the leaders of Donetsk and Lugansk directly, even though that was what they committed themselves to doing in the Minsk agreement in 2015. Putin got Merkel and Macron to agree that it is the Minsk agreement and that is still in effect, that still provides the roadmap and that no other agreement or set of agreements and no, other, no set of proposals coming from Ukraine will be, will be countenanced or will be set in its place. The Germans and the French will have had little, uh, 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 little um, basis upon which to disagree with that. However, it is the implications of what that means that would have made them feel extremely uncomfortable. Firstly, uh, note Putin, note the Kremlin transcripts, words which undoubtedly reproduces Putin's words. The settlement of the internal conflict in that country, namely Ukraine. The Ukrainians have been consistently trying to argue that the crisis in Ukraine is a, uh, um, a war of aggression fought against Ukraine by Russia. Putin is having none of that. This is an internal crisis within, the, within Ukraine. Russia is not a direct party. And to repeat again the words of 
uh, uh, the Kremlin transcript, the president of Russia emphasized that it is important that the Kiev authorities implement all the previous agreements reached at the top level, primarily on establishing a direct dialogue with Donetsk and Lugansk and settling the legal aspects of a state special status of Don, on Don, for Donbass. In other words, in order for there to be a settlement of the crisis in Ukraine, there must be direct talks between Donetsk and Lugansk, the two breakaway republics there, and the people whom Putin pointedly refers to as the Kiev authorities, calling the Ukrainian government the Kiev authorities calls into question its legitimacy. Putin is in effect saying that until there is a resolution of the internal crisis in Ukraine as a result of direct negotiations between those who hold power in Kiev and those who hold power in Lugansk and Donetsk, there is no legitimate government in Ukraine. That is not something the Europeans agree with or are happy to hear, but it is what Putin, in, as the transcript says, a frank and businesslike manner, will have told them. Last but not least, on this section of the readout, we learn about Putin's serious concern about the escalation of armed confrontation on the contact line being provoked by Ukraine and its refusal to implement the additional measures to strengthen the ceasefire coordinated by the trilateral contact group in July 2020. This is a clear-cut warning. Putin is telling the French and the Germans that it is Ukraine which is breaching the terms of the ceasefire, that it is Ukraine that is going back on agreements it made in July 2020. And there is a clear hint here that as a um, guarantor of the Minsk agreement of 2015, which Russia partly brokered, if Ukraine takes further steps which threaten Donetsk and Lugansk, Russia will intervene and will act to protect Donetsk and Lugansk from any action taken by Ukraine. That, I think, is the single clearest and strongest message that Putin will have given to Merkel and Macron over the course of this discussion. We learn that the leaders, that's to say Putin's, Macron's and uh, Merkel's, Political advisers will continue their joint efforts. Notice that, Ukraine's, uh, that Ukraine is not going to be party to those talks between the political advisers, though no doubt the Germans and the French will be coordinating with Ukraine closely. I have made known in recent programmes why I personally doubt that there is going to be the Ukrainian offensive in eastern Ukraine that many people have been talking about. The reason for that is that that Ukrainian offensive would almost certainly fail. And I don't frankly believe that people uh, begin wars knowing in advance that they're going to be defeated. I think after this warning from Putin conveyed to the Ukrainians, through the Germans and the French, the chances of a war in eastern Ukraine anytime soon have lessened further. As for the Europeans, I think they would be horrified by the prospects of such a war, which go would cut totally contrary to whatever objective Merkel and Macron might have had in, in trying to maintain the dialogue with Putin through this meeting, which took place on Tuesday. Now, with that, we come back to the rest, the other topics that were discussed. And I'm going to come to uh, the points made towards the end. 
because I think that they provide the key to the reason for this meeting. We learn from the transcript, we read in the transcript, the following words. They, that is to say Putin, Macron and Merkel, also discussed relations between Russia and the EU. The Russian leader reaffirmed Russia's readiness to restore a normal, depoliticized interaction with the EU, provided there is reciprocal interest. In other words, the Russians will continue or resume a dialogue with the EU, a dialogue which Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said is to all intents and purposes ended. But they will only do so on the basis that it is, in the words of the transcript, a normal depoliticized e interaction. In other words, no lectures about Russian domestic policy, no attempts to put Russia repeatedly in the dock, and provided there is reciprocal interest. In other words, it is the EU that makes make the, the first moves. It must be prepared to speak to the Russians as equals, respecting Russia's rights to conduct its own domestic policies as it sees fit and, and not reciting to, to the Russians the kind of lectures that Josip Borrell sought to recite to them a few weeks ago over the course of that disastrous visit. Again, we learn from the transcript, from the readout, that the meeting took place in a business-like and frank atmosphere. And I am sure that Putin was very frank and very business-like when he pointed all this out. And then, of course, there were all the other various topics that they talked about. There, we learned, for example, that they talked about developments in Belarus. And again, Putin was completely uncompromising. This is what the, what the readout says, the Kremlin's readout says. Vladimir Putin pointed out that foreign interference in the affairs of that sovereign state is unacceptable. Well, whose foreign interference is he talking about? He is talking about the foreign interference of certain EU states. E the EU uh, ambassadors made fairly clear that they were supporting the protests against President Lukashenko. The European Union has cast doubt about the elections that took place in Belarus last year. Um, and of course, Poland and Lithuania have hosted um, um, Belarus, Belarusian dissident politicians like uh, Tikhanovskaya, who's currently in Lithuania, and Poland has been running or hosting uh, uh, various media outlets that have been running a uh, political campaign against Lukashenko and which have been trying to instigate protests there. The Europeans may have come along expecting Putin to show some willingness to discuss Belarus with them. What he said to them is, we Russia back Belarus and you should not meddle in its affairs. So that would have been, a, I suspect, a fairly short and clear-cut discussion with the Russians, as I said, giving no ground. Then there, would have been, then there was a discussion about the situation in Libya. That's one area where clearly there has been some common agreement, and we learn that the leaders, Merkel, Merkel Macron and Putin, noted with satisfaction that the complete conflicting sides have complied with the ceasefire regime and, the, and expressed hope that the establishment of united transitional authorities in the country would become a major step towards an effective political process. So on Libya, at least, they did agree. There was also, however, what I suspect was another frank and business-like exchange of views on the situation in Syria with uh, the leaders, or at least it was, we learned from the transcript, it was pointed out, pointed out presumably by Putin, that continue, Syria's continued, sta uh, continued stabilisation uh, is one of the priority issues and that there should be 
for the provision of humanitarian aid to the Syrian people. This is clearly Russian criticism of the so-called Caesar sanctions imposed on Syria by the United States, which are taking a, a, a heavy toll on that country. And there is a hint that the U European Union should provide humanitarian aid and an indication possibly that Russia shortly intends to do so. Then there is another topic where the EU and Russia, Merkel and Macron, are, and Putin are for the moment in agreement. The leaders of Russia, Germany and France unambiguously called for the preservation and implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran's nuclear programme and continued coordination of efforts towards this objective. Now, notice here that when the French, the Germans and the Russians speak about uh, the need to preserve and implement the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that implies some criticism, first, obviously, of the Trump administration of the United States, which pulled out of the JCPOA, but also of the Biden administration, or perhaps, given the change in formula in the United States, I should speak of the Biden-Harris administration, for its failure to re-enter the JCPOA. This is, if you like, gentle criticism by the Europeans of the United States, perhaps focused on European alarm that Iran, like Russia, is now drifting into the arms of China, as confirmed by the recent strategic partnership deal agreed by Iran and China following Wang Yi's visit to Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit to Iran. And last but not least, we had a reference to Navalny. The Europeans can't, unfortunately, avoid bringing up the topic of Navalny. Failing to do so would be humiliating, and it would, in effect, amount to a repudiation of Josip Borrell, which might indeed put Ros Josip Borrell's position um, in jeopardy. So they had to bring it up. But again, once more, Putin was in an uncompromising mo mood over that. Regarding the issue of Alexei Navalny, raised by the partners, explanations of the objective circumstances of the case were provided. So, the Russians are in no mood to provide any further ground on Navalny. As far as they're concerned, all the facts are on their side, and note the careful use of the word objective circumstances of the case in the Kremlin readout. So, we learn that the talks, as I said, were held in a businesslike and frank atmosphere. In other words, there was a straightforward exchange of views with Putin putting his points clearly and forcefully and without compromise. And we also learn, however, the dialogue will continue. The very last words of the readout was, were, it was agreed to continue working together on all aspects of the current agenda. Notice that the Kremlin readout says absolutely nothing about China. And we don't know whether Macron and Merkel actually brought up the topic of China with Putin, but if they did, Putin will have told them in unequivocal and forceful terms that Russia's relationship with China is not for sale and is not even a topic he is prepared to discuss with the Europeans. If the objective of this meeting was, as I believe, to try to explore the possibility of drawing the Russians away from the Chinese, 
Merkel and Macron would have found themselves on stony ground. So far as the Russians are concerned, they are in an uncompromising move, mood. Yes, they are prepared to provide or export um, Sputnik V to the EU and to agree joint production of Sputnik V in the European Union territory with the Europeans if that is what the Europeans want. But they're not going to let that uh, tantalise and bait them into concessions on other things. Putin took a completely uncompromising position on Ukraine, a completely uncompromising position on Belarus, um, and he made it entirely clear to the Europeans that if they want to reopen a dialogue with the Russians, it will be on Russia's terms. That dialogue must be normal and depoliticized, as the Russians say. In other words, there must be no lectures, no more talks about values, no more attempts to meddle in Russia's internal affairs. It, the Europeans must learn to treat Russia as an equal country and must take heed of Russia's interests and concerns. Certainly, the Russians are not prepared to treat Put Navalny as some kind of a pawn, which they will be prepared to give to the Europeans in order to pr improve relations. I doubt the Europeans, Merkel and Macron, will have come very happy from this meeting. I don't see that they made any progress on their agenda in discussing anything with Putin. They will have found him, as always, sticking strongly to his positions on all issues. The ball, in effect, is in with the Europeans, as the Russians have said, in terms of any improvement of relations. But if the Europeans do want to improve relations, which they can do, not only will it be on Russian terms, but it will also be without any sacrifice of Russia's positions and friendship and indeed de facto alliance with China. Nor should the Europeans be surprised about that. If Russia did not have China at its back, I wonder whether Merkel and Macron would be talking to Putin at all, um, instead of simply attempting to dictate to him. So there we are, a meeting which perhaps clarified some issues, which gave a clear-cut warning from Moscow about any dangerous moves that might be in that might be on anybody's minds in eastern Ukraine, but which in all other respects ended in a complete impasse. A dialogue is going to continue, but it is going to be purely at the level of special advisers. There's no detente, no breakthrough in relations, but the Europeans have been put on notice that if they want better relations with Russia, it will have to be on Russian terms. We will see whether that is what the Europeans eventually decide to do. I doubt that Merkel is prepared to go that far. Whether Macron is, is perhaps more open to question. But I suspect that it will be another generation of European leaders succeeding Macron and Merkel who will have to decide whether to take this relationship forward. Thank you for joining me on this programme. Um, please check out uh, my future programmes, both on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. Please also check out Alex's channel. You will find links under this video. You will also find a link to our new channel where we have interactions with our viewers, uh, we, show, we publish the interactions with our viewers, which take place on our live stream. Please also um, um, check us out on our other platforms, 
BitChute Library and Rumble, and especially Odyssey. Please also um, look us up or, um, or, or, or support us to the extent that you can uh, through uh, PayPal, Patreon, and subscribe style. Um, remember, you can support us uh, through donations or payments in Bitcoin and other such currencies. Uh, last but not least, check out our shop. Look up the amazing things you will find there. Our amazing magic mugs, our, our, our wonderful uh, T-shirts, our hats, our hoodies, and our sweatshirts. And also check out our Discord server and remember to subscribe to this channel and to our other channels. Thank you for joining me for this long and rather complex program um, on a interesting conversation between Putin, Merkel and Macron. And I look forward to you joining me in future discussions of similar complex topics on this channel and on our other channels. Thank you for joining me today.